Welcome to Cover to Cover Book Beat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Our guest today has a wonderful creative flair. He studied film at UCLA, where he also participated in creative writing program led by acclaimed novelist Brian Moore. And he's been involved in the entertainment world for a number of years. He was broadcast producer for 116 episodes of the TV series New Girl, an in-house producer for 36 episodes of the TV series Homeland, and he wrote an episode of Head of the Class, starring one of our favorite Oregonian success stories, Howard Hessman, formerly Dr. Johnny Fever, WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> he has authored short stories, has been published in the UCLA Literary Journal, West Wind, among others. His first novel, Valley Flyers, was awarded the Literary Titan Silver Award. His latest novel, and the subject of our talk today, is Bee Conspiracy, a crackerjack thriller. We're very pleased to welcome back David Boydell. Thank you very much, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, this is kind of a, a, a different aspect of your writing career. It says it involves some unscrupulous characters managing to weaponize hives of the Africanized honeybee, misnamed killer bees. Was there a, an incident or series of incidents that led you to this subject? Well, I've always been interested in the insect world, uh, and uh, it's a world that um, people tend to shy away from out of fear, and um, I really wanted to uh, show uh, another side to insects, and, and so I created this character, Kelso, um, to kind of give people an entry into his world and see uh, the world of insects through his eyes, which is, you know, very different from the average person on the street. Well, yeah, and Kelso is kind of an unusual choice for protagonist. Kelso Bagley is special agent for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, perfectly appropriate for the story. I can't think of any other adventure, mystery, whatever, that starred a Fish and Wildlife Service guy. So this is really intriguing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I thought that would be fun. I have neither uh, really seen a, a character... Um, that does that job either. Yeah. I, you, in your first book, Valley Flyer, you acknowledge that you actually wrote as a screenplay first, and then you later turned it into a novel. Did you work this way with this novel? Well, in fact, yes. Um, I did write a script that was uh, a little different from the book, but um, mm -hmm. this book was inspired by another screenplay, yes. Ah, so when the movies come calling with the options, you say, here, here's the screenplay. You can pay me for that too. Well, yeah, that, in a perfect world, that would be the case. Um, from what I understand, for most authors, typically when uh, Hollywood options the rights to your book, they are very um, eager to hire a Hollywood screenwriter that's not you. Yeah. That's... <laughs> uh, unless you're, you know, somebody really powerful, uh, in which case, you know, you can negotiate that. But in my case, I wouldn't expect that they would ask for my screen. <laughs> well, it's a it's a thought, but it, you, we talked a bit about the last time about how this basically gives you your whole outline, and you just flesh it out as as it were. It does, it does. So yeah, I mean, this is a movie script that I wrote, um, you know, a few years back, and um, I wanted to um, explore this world some more. Um, <clears throat> it um, it's a a subject that's near and dear to me, and so I wanted to. Um, flesh it out a little bit more and bring it to, um, a, a, you know, a new group of readers other than Hollywood script readers, which is a very, very elite, small group of people. Great. Well, and the first was kind of more aimed at a YA audience, but this 74-year-old enjoyed it. And I think this is aimed at adults, but I also think the YA audience would enjoy this as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously I wanted to build on the audience that I had from Valley Flyers, but this is a little bit some of the themes in it, and there are some scenes that are a bit horrific. Uh, certainly, I mean, not to give it away, but there's a scene in the beginning that I've been told is, you know, jarring for some people. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, heightens people's fear of insects. And uh, But other than that, I, you know, then this script kind of, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the book um, evolves into more of a, a procedural type of story. Yeah. It's interesting because this is not one of those stories where you have to figure out who the villain is. You know, it's more about how you deal with this. And yeah. also, uh, the first book had Valley Flyers had a strong influence from Hitchcock's Rear Window. Was there a specific influence like that in this book? Uh, that's a very good question. No, not per se. Um, this book, you know, is I've always been a fan of the uh, the two. Uh, opposed cops on a 
on a uh, on a quest to you know solve a crime. Um, obviously, um, so this this is sort of uh, the buddy cop genre. This is sort of a a, a little bit of a riff on that uh, mm -hmm. with with an entirely different um, uh, you know um, set of circumstances. Yeah, I, well, I like the riff on it. It's a nice variation on the classic. Here is the old jaded cop who was always in trouble with his superiors because he's a bit of a cowboy, and he's teamed up with either a young rookie or someone from some kind of different organization, which this one particularly is. But it's it's a nice twist because your jaded old cop character is named John Wayne, but not after the movie star. I love that twist. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that that was a fun thing to do. Here's a guy with the well, last name Wayne, and his mother was a fan of those movies, and so named him after that character, after you know John Wayne, and calls him Duke. Um, I, I thought that was just a fun little riff to do. It is, and, and my understanding is, I think at one point he says he was named after Duke Ellington rather than than John Wayne, the movie star. Well, yeah, she's a fan of both. She's a fan of both. So, yeah, she, she gives him uh, the first name Duke or nickname Duke and then and his last name's Wayne. So, yes. And I, you know, I don't want to get into too much of the, the uh, actual plot to do any spoilers on it. But uh -huh. let me, let's see, I have here someplace. Again, I have to work for my extensive notes. I take lots of notes when I read the book and... I've got about nine pages of notes from from this one. Um, okay, I'm honored. Okay, uh, I'll I'll check that out. But but there is a case of there's some concerns over the you work into it, the, the the bee colony die off, food shortages. So there's a message in it, but it's it's not like I can't remember which of the Hollywood moguls says if I want a message, I'll send a telegram, but there is a message. I believe that was Gold, Samuel Goldwyn yeah. or Jack Warner, one of the two. Yeah, yeah. But there's a message in here, but it's not a stop and deliver a soliloquy about the message. It's just kind of ingrained in the plot. And I, I liked that a lot. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, obviously I wanted to uh, touch on those subjects of colony collapse disorder and, and, and include those in the story because, you know, those are present day concerns and obviously the theme of you know pesticides and how they affect the ecosystem is one that's near and dear to me i finally found the blurb i was looking for this is actually from i think it's the amazon site it says as concerns over food shortages grow and massive honeybee die-offs an lapd cop and a special agent for u.s fish and wildlife investigate a sociopath kindling mass hysteria to profit from the extermination of biological bees that's a that's a pretty fair description, and it is a lot of fun. I have to tell you, as a reader. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that that's very nice to hear. And, and here's here's stuff where I see. Let's see if I'm if you see, agree with me. The influence of the screenwriter in here, because you do some little teasers to the reader, very early on. It's got the first few pages. You start out and you write. The horizon gleamed with the morning sun as it loomed over San Francisco which introduces a certain mental picture of the reader. And then the next sentence, you pull the reader back from the city by saying, this was not the San Francisco of cable cars, the Transamerica Pyramid, or the Golden Gate Bridge. This was the San Francisco mountain, the highest point in Arizona, just north of the Grand Canyon. That's a gotcha, but it's a fun gotcha. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, the San, Fr San Francisco mountain range yeah, is in Arizona, and uh, I thought that would be a fun juxtaposition because most people aren't aware that that is the case, but uh, yeah, it they was, share the it same name. News to this Oregonian fellow who's not been that down that <laughs> way. Um, and, then, and then you do it again, and this is one thing where I really see the screenwriter coming okay. in. And you say, and this is in more detail, I say, a goose swept down over the crystal blue water as a large bass pokes its head from the lake. The orange sun rose behind the creature, silhouetting the mountains in the background. Again, right in the little picture. Then you consider, it was an idyllic scene. Not the real thing, but the stitching on the jacket pocket, which read U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Department of the Interior. I see the scene set up that fades into the pack. That's a movie trick. Yes, yes. 
Um, there's, you know, writing prose is, is uh, a different, um, you know, muscle to exercise than writing uh, screenplays. You, you have a lot more uh, flexibility to include, you know, colorful passages and descriptions, whereas in a screenplay, uh, just due to the Hollywood system, uh, they, they're very interested in just the minimal amount of words uh, on the page. Uh, they, they're just interested in reading a screenplay very quickly, and um, so it's nice to um, it's nice to work in in the medium of prose because I get to exercise those muscles. Yeah, I also want to compliment you. you there is a, a a bit of a love story woven through this, but it's not. It's not the whole thing, and it doesn't go through a whole lot of agonies about what's going to happen. And it's just kind of a, a subtle, it, it's there, it's like mustard in the sandwich a little bit, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, it, that's, a, that's a good metaphor for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> with long careers in both newspaper and radio, I'm pretty attuned to pick up cultural references. So anytime I run across a song title or something, you did a lot of research for this. I know you did because where yeah. else would you find the song from 1925 about let the bumblebee be and the bee will let you be? How much fun was that? I'm going to let the bumblebee be. I'm going to let the bumblebee be. A bumblebee will buzz, but that ain't all he does. And I ain't the fool that I used to was. I'm going to let the bumblebee be. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to go through and and research, uh, you know, older material that uh, that references insects and bees and things like that. Um, and I, I did do a lot of research on that subject. But and also you researched a lot about insects, too, because I learned about a whole <laughs> bunch of new uh, butterflies and um, all sorts of things. And the one that really kind of got to me was uh, the one that's the uh, uh, right off the runway at the airport is the El Segundo Blue. Is that yes. truly? Just that's the natural place. That's at the end of the LAX runway. That's all real. In the sand dunes there, there's the El Segundo Blue Butterfly, and it's protected. And there's this, uh, this milkweed plant that only grows there. I think there may be one other place in California where this species of milkweed plant grows. And so that has become a protected sanctuary. I do understand that LAX has wanted to lengthen their runway and the environment, environmentalists have fought it um, each time and, and kept that area protected for that very reason, because that, that butterfly is on the verge of extinction. Yeah, I, I, and that does figure into the plot. I won't give anything away about how it figures in, but it is, it's in there. And I also learned about morphos, stoplights, tiger leaf wings, and pink spotted cow hearts, cattle hearts. Yeah, there's all have. kinds of butterflies, and a lot of them are, are collected. Um, some of them are illegally, um, you know, some of them that are on the endangered species list are illegally bought and sold, or caught, bought and sold. And so, yeah, it's a fascinating area um, that, you know, was really interesting to explore. I met with, um, you know, uh, some beekeepers, uh, went to some insect fairs um, and talked to a lot of people uh, about the subject. And it's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and I also want to acknowledge that you also talk about moths as well, including the anophilia moth, palm moths, dusky wings, lichen moths, and Edward's glassy wing. I think Edward yeah. must be happy to have a have a moth named after him. <laughs> yes, yes, <Yeah>. indeed. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then again, uh, speaking more of your research and not just for songs, but for movies, you pulled out the Roger Corman Wasp Woman, which I have not seen in probably 25, 30 years. And it's a yeah. very B-movie Roger Corman one, but you yeah. found that. And then, of course, you mentioned all the 70s, the swarm, the savage bees, the killer bees, all that stuff. That's that's fun. <laughs> well, as a kid uh, in the 70s, I was exposed to some of those horror movies, you know, the Irwin Allen um, movie. And um, 
And that was sort of at the time, you know, uh, that there was just this big fear campaign about bees. And um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wanted to, I, I felt that that was a little, little unfair. Not so much at the time. At the time, I was scared, you know, but, but in hindsight, I wanted to address those movies because they did sort of exploit that fear that people have. Uh, um, I thought it was an interesting thing to explore. Yeah. And, and I, I can understand but not appreciate the motive of the villain here who's going to try to make a ton of money, as usually the villains are in movies. If they're not <laughs> wanting to control the world, they want to own it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and again, I like people that give me new facts that I've not seen before. Um, and it, I won't say how it enters into the story, but I discovered that U, U, Union, UPS has a trademarked Pullman brown color that they insist on all their... Who knew that was a trademark yeah. color? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. Or one well, little detail. Yeah. Or that there's such a thing as a butterfly tag that weighs 0. 0.007th of an what's like seven one thousandths of an ounce, which would have to be in order to track. You remember when electronics were great big things and now they keep shrinking <laughs> yeah. more loss as it gets smaller and smaller and more and more powerful. Um That's true. Yeah. All right. I have to ask you this question because yeah. when you were writing the screenplay, did you cast it in your mind? A little bit, a little bit. I mean, I, you know, I certainly um, you, since I work in that field from, uh, in screenplays, you know, you always you sometimes have an actor in mind. Mm -hmm. Did you, I mean, uh, I have heard that sometimes the screenwriters will say like a John Wayne type actor or something like that. Does that really happen? Do they really mention things like people like that? In the screenplay? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen that so much. Mm -hmm. um, you want to leave that up to the casting director, really, to uh, mm -hmm. to decide, you know, so you want to leave them an open field. Um, typically, I wouldn't do that in the screenplay. Name another actor mm -hmm. referring to a character. Mm -hmm. Um so, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I had some thoughts in mind about who might be good for some of these roles. Mm -hmm. and, I'm not sure I want to name them. Oh, no, that's that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you offline or something about that, though. Um, <laughs> and there is, I can't tell you, to reveal the connection with one of those uh, classic movies, but you managed to weave it into the story with one of the characters having a connection to it. So I'll just leave it at that. And it's another nice, okay. nice little inside bit. Yeah. And again, I, as I say, I take tons of notes. I mean, and you obviously, like all good writers know about in uh, putting the accurate descriptions of the helicopters, the accurate descriptions of their actual brand names and the guns and all of that sort of thing that, that play into that. So you have to do a lot of research as well. Yeah, I do. Um, that's something that I've done in screenplays. I like to name the brand names. Um, just to give it a little specificity. Um, and so I carried that over into this. Um, it just, I feel it gives it a little specificity. I did have one reader mention that it did a review on Amazon that uh, they felt that was definitely a movie thing. Um, so I don't know, maybe, you know, it's just a, uh, maybe it's a bit of taste, but um, I, I kind of, when I read a book, I, I kind of like to have that specificity. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of us do because it makes us feel like we're insiders, too, if, yeah, if we know the, exactly. the inside details. We love that peek yeah. behind the curtain kind of thing. And I want to call out a, a, a short couple of sentences that you wrote, again, as you paint the picture verbally. The tide-dyed citizens of Topanga Canyon walked in and out of the trendy boutiques on Topanga Canyon Boulevard. They purchased eco-friendly vegan shoes, organic cotton blankets, and soy wax candles for prices that would make any hippie of the 60s blanch. <laughs> uh, how yes. the... I don't, I live fairly close to Topanga Canyon, so I've been there many times, and uh, uh, it's a nice place, but uh, it's an interesting blend now. You know, obviously it was in the 60s and 70s, it was mostly hippies sort of living off the grid, and now... Uh, there's a whole new demographic that's moved in there and they're fairly uh, well to do and they like their
techniques and um, things like that. So it's an interesting uh, microcosm, or uh, you know, kind of uh, of culture. Absolutely. Um, also, uh, let's see what I have. My I had my next question in mind, and excuse me, <clears throat> edit that out. Um, well, where was it here? Uh, one moment. Uh, gosh. Oh, I, here's another question for you. Um, there's a character in it who likes spiders because they were a prisoner of war and they were constantly being bitten by the flies. But the, even the black widow spiders didn't bother because they'd spin webs and eat the flies. That's an unusual appreciation of poisonous spiders. Yeah, um, you know, I've, I've, I did some research in the prisoners of war and, uh, you know, when you're stuck in a cell like that, um, an insect is actually a welcome friend, you know? Um, so I thought that would be interesting to blend into that character's background. You also managed to inject a little humor in here. Um, well, wordplay is what I'm, I'm thinking of particularly <laughs> about at one point, Detective Wayne goes, how about a lion's roar shock test? And he says, it's roar shock, John. It's, it's not a shock test, but a lion's roar. <laughs> I like little bits of witty banter between characters like that. I just find that fun. And hopefully that sounds like you did too. So I appreciate you noting that. You know, we call them Easter eggs. when they, They're put in there for people. Some people will catch them. Some people won't. But those that do will really uh, appreciate that. And then there's one more that I have to cite here because this one is is one of those logical conclusions thing. I'm telling you, we can ride this story to the top. I know you're telling me, Jerry said. Why do people say I'm telling you when they're already telling you? You should know they're telling you because they're the one talking. Why have I never thought about that before? I, I, yeah, there's some, it's, there's some phrases in terms of speech that it's... Uh fun to uh deconstruct they 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 don't survive analysis when you go that them logically um, no they don't <laughs> again again i keep i don't want to give away all the wonders of your of your book but there's one more that i'll have to say you at one point you have characters uh, visiting an army area uh and you have the cadence and of course as they run we know that that the troops shout out these cadences and this is a clean one that I can actually quote. Uh, me and Superman got in a fight. I hit him in the head with some kryptonite. I hit him so hard it busted his brain. And now I'm dating Lois Lane. It's it's a not only is it a cadence, it's a cross media reference to another character. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank well, you. I, I have to say, um, I've taken a lot of your time so far today, but I want to ask you what you would like the readers to do. When they close the book, what do you want them to take away from it with them? That's a great question. I um, I would hope that they would see um, insects in a different light, you know, and um, and try and um, try and understand that uh, you know we live in an ecosystem, and um, and there are benefits, although there's widely publicized, you know, horrific aspects of insects. There's also um, there's also some very good benefits that um, certainly bees provide, mm -hmm. um, and um, and you know and many other insects provide that we may not be aware of. So I just would hope that people would find their you know horizon broadened a bit in in terms of that insect world. Right, right, yeah. And without pollinators, we're kind of up the proverbial creek. Uh, absolutely. 100%. And, uh, and I wanted people to be aware of that as well. You know, yeah. that is absolutely true. So, uh, you know, the, the pollinators are integral to uh, our survival on planet Earth. Yep, absolutely. And one, I'll throw one bit of trivia at you that I, I really enjoy. And that is when Sherlock Holmes retired, he retired to the Downs of Essex, Sussex and became a beekeeper. So, I did not know that. Yeah, wow. yeah, that actually that and Doyle actually wrote that and 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 some some aspect of it later on. I, I want to thank you for being with me today again. So much fun. If you've enjoyed this interview, we'll put a link to the one we did before. 
uh, for a ballet flyer on our, our website. And thanks so much. Our guest today, David Boito, the latest book in his soon to be expanding series is called Be Conspiracy. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Roger. It's always a pleasure to speak with you.